Welcome, everybody. My name is Jamie Steef. I work with the Tamarack Institute. You're here for a webinar called Five Community Driven Pathways for Systems Change with Anjum Rahman, Anissa Yanta, Jewel Petley, and Sylvia Chu. Before we get started, we wanted to do a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, I am joining from the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people, colonially known as Waterloo, Ontario. Sharing a land acknowledgement is what I consider part of the truth of truth and reconciliation, just acknowledging the lens that you're on. Um, but that's not where our, our work on reconciliation stops. Um, it's just the first step. We encourage you all to share where you're joining us from today in the chat. And with that, I am going to hand the microphone to Jules. My name is Jules. Um, I'm coming to you from Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, just, to, just to bring us together in this space, um, I am Indigenous New Zealander, so I am what we call, call a Māori. Um, and we would generally, so what we do is we, we open with a karakia or um, a prayer. And you can see there that there's a translation. So it's just about bringing us together in a space and creating a safe space for ourselves. So, um, me karakia tato, so I'm going to say the karakia now. Whakataki te hau ki te uru, whakataki te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tau. E hi aki ana e te ata kura, e tio, e hoka, e hauru, tihei mauri ora. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Or maybe for some of you, it's good morning. Um, welcome to today's webinar, Five Community-Driven Pathways for Systems Change. I'm joined by Anne Jamrantam, Anissa Lajanta, Jules Petley. And um, for those of you who I have not yet met, my name is Sylvia Chu, and I'm the director of uh, in the Tamarack Learning Center with a focus on collective impact. And it's my pleasure to welcome our guests today and all of you. So let me start with a little bit of an introduction. Um, Anjum, Anissa and Jules are systems change leaders from the front lines of community-led equity and inclusion work in Aotearoa, New Zealand. All three are part of SAS, which is a diverse group of women changemakers, rich in experience in the beautiful, messy, never boring systems change approach community initiatives. SAS stands for Systems Change Advocacy, Support and Solidarity. The SAS group recently launched, uh, and this is what uh, caught my eye, recently launched their not white paper, Voices from the Frontline, Community-Driven Pathways for Systems Change in Etora. And that is the focus of our conversation together today. So why don't I begin... Uh, by welcoming all three of you this afternoon. Thank you so much for being willing to take time out of your day. And I believe it's very early. Um, and I think maybe we'll start with Jules. Can I ask you the first question? How would you, how do you all define systems change in your work? So systems change, so we, we in, in our lives, we, we live in a series of systems and sometimes those systems are created intentionally and sometimes they're created accidentally. Um, on the screen there, you'll see some, um, some definitions that we, we work to, but basically the way in which I like to think of it is um, looking at something as a whole, finding the areas in which, oh like, no, sorry, we're talking about what a system is, right? Mm, yep. <laughs> <laughs> systems change. Um, so yeah, systems are things that we live in. So systems change is an approach that recognizes how co complex the world really is and focuses on shifting the whole picture rather than tinkering with little parts. And you cannot do systems change within a system. Or what I like to do is create new systems, like try to create something new, because this one here, even if you try to shift what's in it, it's still going, not serving the purpose that it should be. That's my, that's my, I love that framing about creating new systems as opposed to tinkering with um, the existing ones. With that as a bit of a backdrop, I'd love to maybe turn, uh, ask a question, maybe Anissa, you can lead out. Talk to me about why and how SAS decided to focus on this topic of systems change. 
Yeah, so SAS is a group of experienced community and thought leaders. So we're from very diverse backgrounds. We're all fiercely passionate about community-led, relationship-based, collaborative systems change equity work. We are engaged in a range of issues from youth homelessness, um, ending youth homelessness, food security, housing, disability issues, ethnic women's support, inclusion, to name a few. And it's a really lonely thing sometimes to be spearheading change, as I'm sure a lot of you can relate. There are many dilemmas specific to leading uh, nationwide collaborative systems change work, and especially if you're grounded in the commitment to unpacking your privilege, working on inclusivity, and centering the voices of lived experience. In my um, disability advocacy work, we hear and say often nothing about us without us, and it's the same throughout all communities too, communities lead. So change is messy, change is wonderful, and we really need the company of like-minded people along the journey. And that's where SAS came from. So this core sort of founding group of SAS um, came to be in 2021. We met monthly online to connect, lift each other up, um, share learnings and wisdom, um, and the name, hence the name. So SAS um, stands for Systems Change Advocacy, Support and Solidarity. Um, end of last year, we came together um, for a retreat. Um, we're all over capacity. Some of us were near burnout. We really wanted to bring together that group, you know, and rest and nurture and share our wisdom together, kanohi ki te kanohi, which means face to face. Um, and we widened the circle from there. So we brought in more women who met that criteria of hands-on systems change leadership. Um, to that retreat based in nature, we um, added deep dive sessions on our learnings as leaders of collaborative systems change movements. So to collate the key barriers to sustainable change and to bring out the recommendations on what is needed to support systems change models and that movement to greater equity, because we were all seeing them, you know, we're hearing them again and again, but from individuals. Um, so these learnings all fed into the SAS paper, Voices from the Frontlines. So we channeled all of these learnings from the frontlines and the paper, Voices from the Frontlines is a lever for change. As individuals, we try and make change with our governance boards, with our funders, with government bodies, but with only one voice or one organization's voice, calls to actions were just easily shelved. You know, the purpose of the SAS paper um, is to be backup. So with the paper comes many thousands of voices standing behind individual leaders and practitioners calling for change because together we're stronger and harder to ignore. Um, how we work as SAS is just as important as the impact we make. We have a saying here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, Fano first, and we say that a lot. So it's really um, families, our families come first and ourselves, our health. Um, so we do um, what we can, when we can. In the group, um, SAS women are all super busy. So we make it super easy for people to drop into the work um, and just get on with it and give what they can. Um, some examples of how we're aspiring to be um, inclusive and accessible just within the group. Uh, you know, last year for the retreat and any of our events to enable the SAS women to be there, we have in our budget lines, um, you know, if you're caring for a child, elder, whoever, and you need to bring them with you to participate, you bring them with. So last year we had one of our elders with us, who's I think 94 maybe, and it was just, en it enriched our time together, having that space. So that's how we roll. Um, we also, um, pay release time for SAS women to, um, to do the work, you know, and to connect in. We do not want finances or money to get in the way of people offering, you know, and doing this work. Um, so SAS is wonderful, heartfelt, connected, um, organically developing um, piece of work. And um, collaborative work takes time. It's, this is especially true of diverse groups and emerging work. Um, Jules already mentioned that we can't rush this stuff, you know, we have to be realistic about how we're funding and supporting this community led work. Um, we are very lucky as SAS that inclusive Aotearoa collective Tahono, which um, Anjum is co-lead for, holds SAS as a constellation, they have a constellation model. 
um, and that um, gives us support and the space to work out, you know, if we're standing up, is it a couple of years that we're working together, um, what the next steps are, we've got that support from um, the organisation for two to three years, so if anyone doesn't know about Constellation Model, look it up, it's a really great um, way to work. So Voices from the Frontlines, the paper, the SAS, not white paper, emerged from community wisdom in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but quite a few of us SAS women work internationally, um, and the five pathways and calls to action in the paper are transferable to wherever folks are in the world. Thank you so much, Anissa. I, there's, um, I love the, uh, the transferability and the wisdom. And I think that was one of the things when I read the paper, I was so moved by it. So spoke to, you know, my own experience as well, as well, trying to kind of make big change happen and get, and knowing what a long road it can be at times and how important it is to meet up with fellow travelers along the way. I'm curious, cause I, I'm keen to explore each one of the pathways in the paper, the first of the pathways that you outline is to enable systems change leadership. And so maybe I can ask Anjum, if you could kick us off, who are systems change leaders? Um, and what roles did they play as you, as you explored this? What does it mean to enable them? So it's sort of um, like a three-part question there. Yeah, kia ora koutou, um, and thank you for having us on and organizing this. Um, so systems change leaders really are people who are looking at the bigger picture, who are looking at the causes, the root causes of any given issue, um, and they're looking at long-term solutions rather than the immediate need. So, for example, you know, if we have issues around poverty and food insecurity, um, you know, the immediate need is getting food to people. <coughs> Sorry, and so you might have food banks or other mechanisms to, to do that. Um, but the systems change piece is to look at why they're in that situation, how they come to be in a position of food insecurity, what can we do to, to secure their positions around um, income or, excuse me, the way that we organize and arrange access to food. Um, so that's just one example, and you can think of different examples around housing, health, um, and so on. Um, and so systems change leaders, really, they're looking at um, changing culture, changing processes, changing the way we organize, changing the values that we bring to our decision making. And so our role there would be things like convening people, advocating, persuading, challenging the status quo, um, educating people about the impact of the way things currently work, um, designing solutions through co-design and centering community. So giving agency to people who don't have it which means building them up to be able to, to be in those decision-making roles, but also it's about trusting that they know about their lives and they understand what they need in order to fix what whatever is, is not working well for them now. Um, in terms of supporting them, so, you know, uh, um, working in systems change myself in the sort of belonging and inclusion space um, and what we found with many of the women in the group is one that there's a huge sense of isolation um, as you as you work as a leader in this space um, and you know it's it's messy work and it can be really lonely and um, because often we're working in our own sort of space and issues um, there was not a lot of cross connection to learn from each other or to support each other. Um, one of the biggest things with systems change is that you don't get to see the immediate results of your work right so again going back to the food poverty analogy um, you feed a person, you see the immediate result of they're not hungry anymore. You feel, you know, okay, I've achieved something for today. If you were doing a driver's license in class, because we know a lot of um, people who who don't have access to that and impacts job availability. Um, you see them get their license, you see them driving, you might see them get a job. Um, and all of that gives you the sense of, yes, I'm achieving something. Yes, I'm getting somewhere. I've helped someone. Um, and that motivates and builds you up in terms of your work. With systems change, you often don't see that immediate result because 
it takes time to shift things and you often can't show that direct correlation between your work and an end result or outcome. And so that makes it really hard when you're trying to persuade funders and other people who are supporting your work to show that you're making a difference here and now so that they should continue supporting you. Um, and so that's why it's really important. And we we um, structure the paper so that we're giving advice to supporters and funders of systems change. Um, we often see resistance to change. There are some people who benefit from the current system. Oh, it's working for me just fine. Um, I don't see why we have to do anything different. That makes me uncomfortable. Um, you're in our country now. You should do things like us, for example, or, you know, just it, it's too difficult. It's too complex. We can't do it that way. Um, all of all of these reasons. So you're having to push against that resistance. And often the people that benefit usually have the power to, mm -hmm. to make decisions. So yeah, so that is that is some of the challenge. And so supporting supporting those leaders with um having the support systems around them with having the mindset of you know the complexity of it and and staying in it for the long term and funding for the long term all of these things um help to support systems change leaders beautiful that's beautiful i like i love your metaphors about you know the distinction between you know uh like a, an immediate response and the validation that it gives and the um you know and the challenge then that added dimension of um why systems change work can be difficult for those leading it the second pathway um uh, really emphasizes the importance of relationship and collaboration why are these two things in particular centered out by you folks in the work of systems change maybe Jules I can throw that to you um, I think we all understand that no change is ever achieved by yourself. Um, and I think that's the mantra of any systems change practitioner, irrespective of what level they're working at. And I think even um, we understand, humans in general, understand that um, we have to work within um, systems to change them. So if you think about like a food system, for example, there are so many players working within that food system. You can't shift something there without having um, the supermarkets, the, the suppliers, the, um, the local grocers, like everyone who's involved in that, in that food system, the school, the, the local kindergartens, whoever it is, need to be part of those conversations to be able to shift the way in which that system's working. If you don't, nothing's going to change. Um, and I think, so, so, so working backwards, if you want to be able to create that change, you need to be able to have really strong trusted relationships. And trust is the, is the key when you're wanting, when you're wanting to, to move things. Because like Anjan said, you can't, um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of things that could go wrong. Um, you, can't, you can't write what the outcomes are going to be when you're trying to shift a system. You, can't, um, you, can, you can hope, you can forecast. Um, but if you're being funded, you can't you can't tell a funder that the X, Y, and Z is going to happen. So you need to have really strong trusted relationships um, with whoever you're receiving money from, um, but also the people in which you're trying to the people working within the um, the system you're trying to shift. And I think um, the other thing too is that. The, the, loads of, the load is lessened and people understand different um, systems from different perspectives when you bring all those different groups to get, uh, different people together from the different groups. Um, so for example, if you're trying to change the public, the public transport system, which in Auckland they're trying to, the good times, uh, but I don't understand what a bus driver goes through. Um, but, I, but I can speak to like being a single mother trying to get a pram onto a bus. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you what it's like to fix a road but the, um, the traffic management people would. So those are the kinds of things that you need to take into consideration when you are um, trying to shift a system. And all those, and, so, and the other thing too is how do you bring those people together? Because sometimes um, they don't see any value in being part of it, especially when you can't see what the outcome is going to be. So that comes back to those trusted, strong relationships. And then how do you, how do you build those relationships? So you have to think about um, what you're bringing to the table and how you are 
how you're um, sharing the relationship. And that's it. I think that's amazing. That's just it, right? If only. Um, but you're right, you know, that coming together, everyone holding that peace, but also understanding why things work the way they do or, or what you need from the system, being vulnerable enough to say, this is what I need, but also this is what, um, this is what I can contribute, um, is huge. I'm just going to, can I just jump in there too? Sure. Um, to build on what Joel said, and um, in my work, um, leading a big um, national coalition in its establishment phase, a lot of that collaboration also needs to be if you're changing systems. So there's the, we're going to do things ourselves within community, get it going and then get government so they can't crash stuff. There's that model, which I'm totally there for. But for those of us who are also doing that cross-sector collaboration, we've got issues of power and privilege there, right? Mm. So really making sure that the community, that the lived experience voices uh, have as much, are seen as having as much value as those, you know, coming from government or academia or, you know, so raising the platform, talking about these issues, you know, that sort of um, belonging and in, inclusive, unpacking your privilege and empowering, um, you know, community folks to push back to government and to corporates to say, hey, sit down, this is our stuff, your role is to support you know, so that's also what the paper Voices from the Frontlines is about, is giving that sort of like extra bit of spiky fierceness to go, no, this is how that's going to roll. You know? And the and the value and necessity of it, I think, is coming through loud and clear already in in um, your responses and you're walking this through for us. Um, you know, the other thing I was going to say, your third pathway really focuses on the need to address racism, bias, exclusion and the importance of these diverse voices. And I think you've kind of hinted at this, Anissa, but I'm wondering, Anjum, can you share some effective strategies to promote inclusion and create those kinds of safe spaces? What are the practices that we need to pay attention to, to welcome diverse perspectives? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's important to think about the impacts of discrimination. So <clears throat> what happens when you're on the receiving end of discrimination, what is that designed to do? Actually, it's designed to silence voices. It's designed to exclude. Um, you're seen as less worthy, um, less belonging in the space. Um, again, as I mentioned before, you're seen as too much trouble. Um, and, and so that has the impact on people on the receiving end. Often they start to believe those things about themselves often um, there's a huge lack of trust often they don't want to come to the table because they've been hurt so many times before right um, and be made to feel inferior or be made to feel there's something wrong with them not just that they do things or see things differently and that can be from multiple you know um, disability gender identity whatever like all of these things so when you're addressing those things the first thing is is the relationships piece um and <clears throat> taking the time to socialize the group and build those relationships of trust <laughs> excuse me i've just at the tail end of cold um so when we organized our retreat um it was a two and a half day retreat and we had absolutely no program for the first one and a half days which a lot of the um, women that came in because they're used to being busy and doing and you know it was uh, for many of them it's like oh so what are we doing why you know and we're like we're having a break we're giving you the break that we know you need <laughs> that's why you've invited but also it was a time to just have those casual conversations and build the relationships and socialize the group. And that is so critically important. Um, secondly, it's it's good to build some agreements or if I hate the terminology, but like rules of engagement. But what we mean is developing that shared understanding of how we work together. Um, and because people work differently, they work at different paces, they work with different cultural understandings, different senses of time and urgency. Um, and so again, taking the time to build that sense of agreement around how you work. Um, purako is a word, a Maori word, which is around um, the sharing of stories. And 
it's so critically important to understand people and to share our stories because that's how we get to know each other that's how we build the understanding and you know there's that old saying that you know you could have the statistics of of hearing of you know a thousand people died in something but when you know one of those people it means something very different than to hearing that statistic so so getting that sh- stories uh, getting those stories out there and building that safe space for them to be able to share <coughs> um and having that open communication um listening to understand and we kind of i don't know about you know we've got people around the world we kind of live in this debate culture and so we don't listen to understand we listen to argue we listen to refute we listen to prove the other person wrong we listen to win um and that is really unhealthy and so I'm the kind of person who says I don't debate I dialogue um because we want to listen to absolutely find out where that person is coming from what they mean to uplift them um and that's a a different way of working um very quickly budget we've got to make sure that people have time and space to do this kind of work and and so um Participation often depends on resources. So what Anissa talked about around um, release time and those kinds of things are critical. Um, And then there's the institutional racism piece. So just building that awareness that the ways that we think about and the ways that we design can exclude people. Um, And also recognizing intersectionality. So people might face discrimination from multiple angles. Um, And so it isn't just that, for example, they're dealing with a gender gender discrimination, they might be dealing with colour discrimination, they might be dealing with a disability issue, all at the same time. So again, it's around building that understanding and allowing them to share their stories so you can have that understanding of what they need and how they need to work. That's so beautifully articulated. And you know, the gift on the other side, of course, is that I I leave this conversation absolutely enriched. My own perceptions of what, you know, what the realities are in my community are much more grounded in a diverse reality. Um, So I think that's so beautiful. Your fourth pathway really does talk about the funding and bureaucratic challenges to systems change. So I'm going to maybe start with Anissa. Can you say more about how traditional funding practices create barriers uh, for this systems change work and some positive examples? Absolutely. We were laughing because I could talk at length about this and often have. (laughs) So, excuse me. So traditional funding practices are a massive barrier to systems change work for sure. Um, Often our initiatives are under-resourced, which leads to burnout of our people. And the only thing worse than burning out on a leadership level is watching your team burn out. It's heartbreaking. Um, There's short grant funding periods so that can sink community-led projects that need more time to get up and running. Um, And funders tend to like, the traditional funders tend to like the big new shiny projects. We've all heard this, right? New programs with media, you know, sort of a lot, lot of glitz. Um, and often won't support operations, but no program runs without our vital admin folks and salaries, right? Um, Ridiculous amounts of time and money are spent on securing funding um, or on writing reports that may only get read once. And I've worked in philanthropy, they might not even get read that once, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, just to bring that to life, one of the systems change sort of supportive funders here in Aotearoa, Todd Foundation, um, we were working together a few years ago, and I see that Jamie has posted the waters of systems change um, from FSG there, that link. So Todd Foundation, we took the qualities of that um, that graphic, and they that was their report. So it's it's useful, you know, for the funder to see. It's useful to do with the board. And it's something that builds on the work. It doesn't take away, you know. So really encouraging funders to do that sort of useful, lightweight, you know, collaboratively developed 
um, reflection or um, you know evaluation report. I don't, I don't even use the word report anymore because when I say evaluation report or funding report, basically everyone in the field just sort of cringes. You know, we, we, we've got those associations with them and that tells us we need to move away from that language um, and practice. So we've talked about truly community-led systems change work, how slow it is, how messy and by nature relationship rich to build the trust. Um, and our funding and uh, you know, bureau bureaucracy around that needs to reflect um, the actual work. True, um, so psychologically it's challenging for humans to fully commit to doing this work with funding instability hanging over our heads. So you know, in our work, we're looking at two years ahead, five years ahead, 10, 25 and beyond, right, for our people. Um, without changing the systems. And yet on the other hand, we've got funding that's maybe six months, a year, two years. It's just not, you know, psychologically it's really hard and takes too much time. So um, there are some great positive stories worldwide, but, and I think especially in Aotearoa, it's been amazing to watch. I've been in this work for 30 years now, more. So, um, so to flip the traditional funding practices, which are those barriers and get in our way, we're looking at longer term, so multi-year funding, um, simple application and evaluation processes, um, and prioritizing relationships and care in our budget lines. So funders know within money, you know, into that language, what it actually takes to resource and really do this mahi, this work. Um, so for funders, we're asking, you know, putting a call out there to really listen and trust your systems change leaders on what's needed. Yeah. Um, instead of accountability reports, turn up and connect into the work and then funders write the report if they need it. Yeah. So we, ha we have that with our funders. So they'll have a meeting, they'll decant, you know, and send us something. Is this reflecting what you want to do? We're all good. Let's go. You know, so really making it easy to drop into and light touch. Um, and a story to kind of highlight, um, you know, how much time is wasted is that years ago, when I came on board as manager of the Funding Network New Zealand, I assessed how much time it took from charities in our first application round. There were 33 charities that applied, three were successful, and there were hundreds of hours, hundreds taken away from vital community work to do a long, you know, weighty application process. And only three of those were successful to go through. That was not acceptable. So we streamlined to an expression of interest um, and to make it accessible, we had four framing questions, very simple, that people could text, they could make a video and send, they could, um, you know, pick up the phone and call within certain hours, they could email it. So really looking at inclusion, you know, accessibility, if people have a hard time with the written word, they can pick up the phone. Um, and then we just did due diligence on selecting six for the full application. And we had, and the three that were not successful to get through in that round, we had, you know, connections and some a body of work for them. So it wasn't for nothing, you know? So really um, funders taking on the weight because they're way better resourced than those on the front line will ever, you know, will be for a while yet. So that was a great example of how, you know, one person can come in and just start pushing back. Um, and in terms of positive funding stories, you know, all of us SAS women are super keen on building that culture of collaborative funding. And there's been some great examples lately um, as lead for DECA, um, Digital Equity Coalition Aotearoa, which is an emerging um, coalition a few years ago, three funders came together. So Spark Foundation, Internet NZ and Todd Foundation um, and worked together, took the weight off, you know, those who were doing the do and they worked out the funding. So they committed three years up front, so we could see in the projected budget, we knew that we had this time and that's what it takes, right? It was all untagged funding as well. So there was none of this, this needs to go here and this, it was just a rollover to the next year and all relationship based. Um, and Jim has shared a great story um, close to her, a regional COVID response funding story um, led by Trust Waikato um, that included several funding bodies, so local government, a local energy trust, and they had grantees submit one simple application, so one page for each of those funding bodies, and it was set up so 
um, grants were made quickly in response um, to great community need in that time. So that worked really well. And another story, the last one I want to sh um, share with you is on the east coast of the North Island here in Aotearoa. It's an economically challenged, culturally rich and beautiful area. And we noticed within, you know, funders noticed that the, a lot of the projects coming out of those those places were not getting funded because it was inequitable. The traditional funding practices are basically inequitable. So a group of um, uh, funders, so a collaborative group came together and they're providing five year untagged funding with one simple funding agreement between them. Um, no report write, writing at all, but visits to the communities built in. So, you know, that sort of built in, you know, relationship building happening. So all of those collaborative funding um, uh, situations are built on strong relationships. So, um, and as part of that, there's a lot of honesty and learning happening, right? So what works, what doesn't, what do we need? You know, there's another level of looking at power and privilege and, and being honest and sharing the learnings within that, rather than ticking the boxes and just being shiny and everything's fine, yeah? So the work that's emerging from these progressively funded trust-based community-led systems change initiatives is incredible. It's mm -hmm. really doing what it's set out to do. People are empowered, you know, um, there are great relationships and what's emerging out of those regional spaces is able to be mimetic and customized for other areas. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been really exciting to see some of those take off. Um, just to finish up the section, the SAS paper uh, has, uh, at the end, it's got some checklists for ease of action. So there's one for systems change funders, one for systems change practitioners, and one for supporters. And so, you know, if you're working with your funders, you can take the checklist with them and go, this is the future, you know, this is what we need to be doing. How are you doing? Let's go through these. And, you know, how can we get this into place? You can use those to work through with your boards and your funders to um, nudge them in the direction that makes your work um, more sustainable and impactful. Thank you, you know, so much. I'm so, oh, go ahead, Anjum, yeah. Sorry, um, just to support what Anis is saying, one of my roles is actually um, to be on the board of a funder, Trust Waikato, and so going in there and just looking at the way they were doing things and the criteria they had, so for one example is um, that organisations had to have a track record of proven governance skill, and I said, you know, at the time, well, that's immediately shutting down new and emerging organizations. It's shutting down all those communities that never got the chance to develop those skills. And so you immediately um, said that priv already privileged organizations are going to get our funding. So we changed that. And also um, one of the other trustees brought in the deprivation index. And so that is one of the things that we assess all of our grants on now is the deprivation index to make sure that our money is going to the areas that most need it. So, you know, those are other examples in terms of funders really thinking about who needs our money, how can we get it to them, how can we support them to build and develop the skills they need to hold it and take it forward um, and how do we make sure that it's not just you know this elite club of people that are giving money to to you know and I'm not saying that the causes aren't valuable they are valuable causes but is it the greatest need in the community right now when we think of the system as a whole or society as a whole um, and so yeah I think it, it's really critically important to have that really questioning eye and terms of how have we structured, what are our criteria, how can we make better decisions um, around these things. I think that's beautiful. Uh, it's interesting as you were speaking, it brought to mind our colleague Miriam um, um she led um, a partnership project with uh, the region of Peel, which has a very high percentage of newcomers, as well as the Miriam Asefa Fund from uh, Wes, and it was a participatory grant making project where members of the community actually set the criteria for how these funds should be allocated to support economic mobility for newcomers 
and then participated in reviewing and selecting the grants. And it was just so inspiring to see not only the process, but also to see how these projects have flourished and are meeting some absolutely unique needs in the community. Um, and then the other one that I was just involved in with the others on our team was with the Public Health Association of Canada, who had a big fund, multi-year fund, and were very cognizant that some of the smaller organizations had beautiful ideas but didn't have the infrastructure. And so we were given an opportunity if they were, if they had, you know, they were a smaller entity that they could get some coaching as support in the development of their proposal. So there's all kinds of beautiful um things happening to experiment, which I think gives me lots of happiness that maybe we're shifting the systems of our funders. Um, uh, we have a few more minutes and I wanna make sure folks, if you have questions and haven't put them in the chat, please go ahead and do that. Um, final pathway is about encouraging experimentation and amplifying transformation. And it really highlights that, you know, that long-term commitment that you were speaking of and the commitment to innovation, which is far more uncertain and emergent than a proven program or project. Maybe I can throw this one to you, Jules. What do you think motivates people? What did you hear from the SAS women at your gathering? Why do they take on this impossibly hard work? I think, um, so if I can speak to my own experience, um, and I'm sure other people have very similar stories who are working in, in this space. Um, as a Māori New Zealander, I would constantly hear negative stats about my my family, my communities, uh, poor health, health stats, poor um, education stats, poor um, high numbers of incarceration, just all these, all these things that, that these people kept saying to me about my community. And um, so I thought to myself, well, why is it like that? Why, why are these things like this? Obviously, there's colonization, but that's, that's another whole webinar. Um, so I thought to myself, how can I, well, how, if, if, I, if, if it's not changing, who's going to change it? And so I, I constantly think, like, if, if, if I'm not going to do it, then who's going to do it? And I, I'm pretty sure it's very similar. For a lot of other people who are working in this space, they can see that something is not working and they want to change it. Because um, the systems aren't serving us, are they? Um, and I think, yeah, that's that's it. Like you, there's something internally driving you to, to change some, some the things, the way things are. You're on mute. So Your comments <laughs> about it's my family, it's my community. There's an ownership, there's a caring, there's a connection, which brings us full circle to the power of relationship, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So as we make our way to questions, just one, if I can just ask you, each of you to kind of quickly um, go around and say, what's next? What's your hope? What happens to this work? Um, this beautiful report, the work you're continuing to do. Any any thoughts, any comments about that? Yeah, Anjum, take it away. Um, so we're really lucky um, to have received funding for a second retreat. So I do want to acknowledge the funders that have supported us this far, um, which are Todd Foundation, Clare Foundation, um, Weave, and particularly J.R. McKenzie Trust. Um, so we were lucky to get funding to do the initial retreat and we got funding to launch this paper and now we have um, secured our funding to have the second retreat and so we're looking to organize that now as we speak um, and our focus now is going to be to pick up some of the recommendations in the paper and some of the um, some of the stuff that came out from the launch event to maybe pick um, or come to two or three projects that we might focus on. Um, one of the really um, exciting, important um, recommendations from the report that resonated with me was having an organization that could allow systems change leaders to take sabbaticals because the burnout um, was really high. And so to be able to get take a month to be um, to have that thinking time, to reflection time, the just space that you don't get when you're in it and just 
working and working and working. Um, and so to have an organisation or something that will come in, just look after and keep things ticking while you're away so that you know everything isn't going to crash and burn while you have the break that you need. Um, so there's, there's several recommendations in the report. So we, we want to come to a consensus around what are the ones that we can pick up? What are the actions that are needed? Um, and um, then, you know, who who is available or how can we make it happen or what further resourcing do we need? Um, so, yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, okay. And... Yeah, and, and really building the collective as well. So um, I'll hand over to Anissa to follow up if there's anything else. Yeah, um, there's the huge voice, like so many voices and so much feedback. You know, we had women sort of in tears, you know, reaching out to say, I've just read the paper and it's been so hard. And I just feel you all wrapping around me, you know, in my work. So, you know, and, and funders saying, oh, I'm trying to make change and now I can point to this, you know. So um, that's been really gratifying to know that that, that niche that we um, brought the paper into fill, you know, as a lever for change is, is there, is working. And just things like when we launched the paper, it wasn't your traditional launch. We did a World Cafe style, you know, sort of like real deep dive, lots of post-it notes as, you know, systems change tends to involve a lot of those. Um, and so what we heard was the value, like a lot of those amazing leaders in that space had never been in a space of all people who understand, you know, um, systems change work, you know, and in a way to someone, a couple of bits of feedback that I got um, was like, you know, I'm, I'm never quite sure, but I felt like I could speak, you know, there were hard things to say, I've never said them out loud before, but this felt you know, like a space where all of me and my culture my, it was welcome. So there's lots of indicators that we're, you know, on the right track and that there's lots of points of difference. It's really important. Um, and there's so much to do. So we really want to pinpoint what it is that, you know, bringing up mentoring new leaders into systems change. Is it, you know, a collaboratively funded agency to support, you know, going forward? So we've got some really great stuff on the agenda to um work and some amazing funders walking alongside us. So yeah. we're excited. Um, those seeds of change are within our communities and our job as facilitators of change is to water those seeds, you know, um, and nurture them um, and not wait on those broken systems. You know, we know that um, we, we're on the front lines. We know the stories of need. We see them playing out. We see the pain. Um, we can't wait. We have to work together. Um, and so the SAS paper platforms those community voices on where the barriers to healthy systems change are and provides some clear actions to bridge to more equitable practice. So it's our gift to all of you. Um, and it's been an amazing process as women together, you know, in that diverse group, a really beautiful um, experience and process. Um, so the paper is a reminder that you're not alone, that we stand with you along with so many others making change. So. Thank you so much. I'm really eager to make sure we don't lose time because there's some wonderful questions in the chat. Um, starting with Jamie, do you want to do you want to take this uh, take this in or lead us out? You yeah, probably... sure. And we're seeing a lot of um, like as as the panel has been talking about their own next steps. We're seeing people ask questions about you know realistic next steps in their communities. We're seeing people talk about you know is it encouraging rest for you know marginalized members of uh these movements is it we're seeing a question on you know uh city council's stonewalling action on a movement do you do you go and target uh <laughs> to build a grassroots coalition to try and take on you know unmovable municipal actors um i guess the question that we're hearing in, in a few different ways is um when we're trying to balance uh, rest versus <laughs> rolling up your sleeves and, and diving in deeper, what what suggestions can you give to those listening? And can I start on that? Um, <clears throat> it's interesting how this whole project started um, was 
between we were having monthly calls myself innocent and other member of the group Jane Zintel and it was because we were every month talking about how stressed how burnt out what the pressure points were for our organization and recognizing that that was a need for everyone and so many women that we knew um so I think some of it is the starting point is the reaching out you know, and the finding the people, finding your people. And I have to say, Anissa was the one that reached out to us, um, a few of us, to to get get us talking. Um, and I'm I'm a really strong believer in the power of the collective and the power of people coming together. So um, I think that's you know when you are really busy, carving out that initial first chunk of time. But one hour a month was doable. And it was enough to kind of get us thinking and get us going. Um, and we also, you know, strongly built diversity into the group. Um, so, and that's why it's a not white paper, because many of us in the group are not white. <laughs> so, so that's why we, we called it that. But um, uh, yeah, so that's the first step is finding people, finding a few people, getting going, just starting with some conversations. How can you, what's needed, who has what relationships, because we all had different relationships that we could leverage to, to get us going. Um, so yeah, those are, and, and we did find and we did feel that particularly within our context, there were a lot of women that were on the front line. When you're talking about community di driven, systems change that yeah. generally it was women and that they were underpaid and overworked and under recognized for the kind of work that they do which is which is why it has been a group of women but I'll That's, stop there and end over that was a question I noticed Robin was just on her way and she was saying she was so sad she had to leave but she posted the first question interesting that um it's all women in the SAS group and wondered if this was a conscious decision or mainly because it is the women that are working at this level across Aotearoa. So I don't know if 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 there's anything in particular around that um, that one any of you. I realize we only have about two minutes left, but um, if any of you want to comment on around that as well. I think Anjum covered it in that that is who was doing the mahi that we saw. And there is a special power, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> yeah, in, in that, in us being together as women too. So, and, you know, I think that photo of us all is really powerful, you know, in terms of who we all are. I just love that. You know, it's a real honor to be in this space. And I just wanted to go back to that rest theme that someone asked about before I hand off to Jules. You know, rest, it's not going to change just because of intention. We have to back each other in that, check in, you know, encourage each other um, and put it in our budget lines, you mm. know, like um, make sure it's factored in. So for hours, you know, you're putting out, a, you know, in your diary and on your staff and your, you know, colleagues that you've got a day, you know, that you're not, that's just for you, you know, so you've got to factor it in. Um, and it's a real mind shift. And I want to, to just say that it's a radical act because we need it. And if we burn out, we can't do the mahi. And otherwise, if we are only, um, you know, we're asked so much and it's a privilege. So a lot of folks working in not-for-profit sector, especially, I mean, here in New Zealand anyway, <clears throat> you know, they've got wealth, they come from wealth or they have privilege. And so they can take a lesser amount of money, you know, or not be paid you know, and they've got support, but then you end up with the not-for-profit sector and change being a privileged space, you know, so we've got to, you know, sort of push back and make sure that we are valued, you know, with what we bring into those spaces, so be staunch okay. with it, you know, yeah. like living wages and more that, you know, you're really worth Love it, and so really back yourselves, you know, and sort of have a conscious, um, and that's where a group like SAS can really be helpful, you know, so partly it was SAS to see what was needed. Can we inspire others to do that? Because it's been of such benefit to all of us. That is so lovely and a beautiful note. We have one minute or two minutes left. If I can turn it over to Jules, if you could, please, to close us out in a good way. You're muted. I just realized I'm muted. Thank you. Thank you for this rich corridor um, conversation. Thank you for everyone for your questions and thank you for your support. It's been really awesome. Um, as is tradition, we need to, once we open something, we need to close it to bring 
to make sure that we um, continue with our day in a safe space, in a, sp in a safe way. Um, so me kara kia tato, kia whakatairia, kia wātia ai te ara, kia tiri ki whakataka ai, kia tiri ki whakataka ai, homie, huie, ai ki e. Thank you all so very much. Thanks, everyone. Go and have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Any last wrap up questions or comments you need to cover, Jamie? Uh, you can see in the chat that I shared um, a couple of upcoming webinars and a workshop that Sylvia is hosting. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording of today's conversation in the next day or so, as well as links that were shared in the chat. And yeah as well as a feedback survey. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's conversation. But thank you all for joining us today.